When we take and we look at positioning, we need to initiate appropriate positioning when this infant comes to our unit. We need to take and make sure that we avoid any complacency in positioning and that, you know, oh, we don't have time for it. Or the fact that when the infant becomes medically stable, then we'll try to do some more appropriate positioning. You know, molding takes place. We have a direct influence on the musculoskeletal system from the day that this infant arrives in our unit. We also need to adopt positioning as a uh, goal in our unit and that proper positioning should be a standard in our unit and that we need to take into account where this infant is, what is happening, what you know is the medical status of this infant, how do we make a difference with positioning, what support needs do we do need. We need to also make sure that we get the occupational therapist and the physical therapist in our unit as soon as possible. Many people avoid them until two days before they go home. You know, we need to be proactive. We need to encourage our neonatologists to bring in that physical therapist, that occupational therapist, so they can help us to assess this infant so that we can start preventative measures before the infant goes home. What this does is that it gives parents a more manageable infant when they go home and one that they can continue the therapy and that they're just sort of kind of not so far in the hole, you know, and getting this infant to where this infant needs to be at that point in time. And if you'll notice, even while I am speaking, I have a right-sided preference. You'll notice that my head goes to the right a good bit because that is my preference. I'm right-handed. And, you know, we as adults are conscious about this and can compensate and correct this. Our infants do not have that ability. So we have to instigate a protocol and policies and procedures in order to help them to overcome this and to be able to deal with this to decrease any type of malformations or any kind of negative musculoskeletal situations that can occur. And whenever we do this, we actually help to enhance their long-term and short-term outcomes. That does make a difference. We also need to take and look at other ways to implement, okay? We've talked about positioning, but you know, we can position, but what if we don't have anything in order to help contain this infant? So we need to look at what would a nest do? You know, building a nest, building those boundaries that the amniotic sac and the intrauterine environment had so that we can actually take and work with this infant and that we can provide him with those boundaries that are necessary. We, you know, need to do this because it helps to stimulate that intrauterine environment. It helps this infant to have that proprioceptive input that is most important to him so he can identify where he is and his space and uh, have a much better idea of what is taking place and feels like he is much more in control. Swaddling and the fact that swaddling and bringing those hands close to face and mouth and pulling up those knees and, and giving him a nice positive swaddle. That's very beneficial if we're going to be feeding our infant. We can actually swaddle our infant to give a bath, which is actually very, very pleasing and very, very calming to our infant. And then, of course, you know, we need to make sure that we've got protocol for repositioning our infant. And the fact that, you know, I laugh sometimes because, you know, we think that he's on a spit, so we're gonna be right-sided, then we're gonna be prone, and then we're gonna be left-sided, then we're gonna be supine. But I do think that we need to be cognizant that all of these positions have a very positive force to play with our infants. I know that many times we have our infants that are on an oscillator, and we maybe are not going to be turning them. But have you ever realized that you can take the head, and your head has many, many different positions? Maybe we have it totally midline, but we can actually take it and turn it just a little bit, okay? And then we can take it and we can turn it back and we can start going this way. So therefore, we are alleviating all the pressure points that are on the back of the head and are actually creating more uniformity with our infants. The other thing is, is the fact of always taking and being keenly aware of the cues that our infants are giving us. They let us know when they're uncomfortable. They're not going to speak up and tell us, but we can actually see them stretching. We can actually see them being uncomfortable. They're sort of squirming. You know, maybe they're grimacing. Maybe there's some other subtle cues that they give us to let us know that they are not comfortable and that we do need to reposition. Now, if we're taking and looking at position techniques, 
let's take a look at what we would do with a supine position. We want to make sure the head is in midline. We want to, and sometimes we find hospitals that are actually using a, a supine position for the first few days that the infants are in the unit because there has been some literature and some documentation that says that we do decrease the incidence of an IVH during those first two to four days uh, after delivery when we take and put them in a supine position with supports. You know, we always need when we're in supine to be keenly aware of where our endotracheal tube is. We want to try to position it so we're not riding the roof of the mouth. We also want to make sure that there are no pressure areas whenever we are positioning our infant. We want to also be keenly aware that the nasogastric tube could be in the way. We may need to move it from one side to the other side so that it is more comfortable for our infant. And of course, you know, as we talked about a few minutes ago, when we have an infant that is on a ventilator, we need to be keenly aware that we don't try to hang him by his ventilator tubing and that it is in a comfortable, relaxed position and that uh, we're not putting any undue stress or strain because many times we're taking and pulling it so that we get a tremendous amount of extension in the neck. So please try to avoid those if you can. We're taking and looking at supine and avoiding neck rolls. We've all, you know, some of us have used neck rolls in the past, but I've come to realize that they're really not necessary because if we truly get our infant in a good midline physiologically flexed position with boundaries and supports and so forth, Usually we don't have to worry about a neck roll because when we used a neck roll it was just to keep us from having this infant to be, you know, uh, in a position so that he, you know, cuts off his airway, okay? So therefore we want to take and maybe avoid the neck rolls but actually support the shoulders, round those out which will actually help to bring the uh, neck in a good midline orientation and we do not have to worry about the fact of uh, any airway in you know, any airway uh, negativity at this point in time. We also want to make sure that we have our knees partially flexed. We also want to make sure that they're supported. We also want to make sure that we have got where our feet are being able to foot brace. And we want to foot brace, you know, with our feet inside the boundaries, not out looking for a boundary. So, you know, there are many things that we need to look at when we're positioning an infant in a supine position. I found that working with the OTs and the PTs in the unit, they can really give us some very good helpful hints on how we can position an infant and for them to be much more comfortable. The next thing that we have to look at is the picture, you know, this slide here. We're in a supine position, but is this infant supported at all? He looks like he's laying on a bed of just comfort, okay? And I think we've got a sheepskin there. We've got things supported, but look where his knees are. Look at where his feet are. Look at where his shoulders are. This infant is nowhere near a midline physiologically flexed position. He's probably very stressed by this. He probably feels very, very disorganized with this. And uh, he probably is you know, begging for us to give him some supports. He would be an ideal candidate for us to give him those boundaries that will help him to maintain more organization than what he has now. We also need to take a look at this infant here in a supine position, but we're hanging him by his ET tube and the fact that we have it pretty taut. We've got his head in midline, but you know, we really haven't done anything to support the arms. And remember, he's gotten his arms back like this, and it's just going to take a tremendous amount of effort for us to get them anywhere else or to get them so that they're more in midline. We needed to look at rounding out the shoulders on this infant to give him a little bit more of a positive position. We take and look at this picture here and the fact, look at the extension. Remember extension is easy, flexion is hard. And the fact that every time someone touches this infant, we have an infant that just will automatically go into extension. So I really encourage you to take and to start looking at how we can keep these infants in flexion when they come to us. What can we do to prohibit the fact that extension will be their choice? Because remember when extension is their choice, Whenever you go to pick them up or to touch them, they're always going to go into extension. Parents have a very difficult time dealing with an infant that goes rigid and becomes uh, in extension because we can't necessarily cuddle them. We can't bring them close because they meet us with significant resistance. And of course, if we take and we look at this picture here, this infant midline, physiologically flexed, 
hands, you know, shoulders are rounded. Those hands aren't close to face. They are up around the head, so that's good. And then, of course, if we take and look at his feet, look how they're foot bracing. He's got something there that provides him with some tremendous support. So, you know, it's important that we take and we look at our infants and so forth after we position them and be sort of kind of critical of ourselves and, and, and how we've positioned them and what we need to do.